Okay, this is Mark, and we're going to, um, this is technically part two, and we're going to deal with the covenants. We asked last time what it meant to say that God is Lord, and we looked at the lordship attributes of control, authority, and presence. Now I want to ask the question, uh, how does the Lord interact with us? And we'll see that the he doesn't just do it willy-nilly. Of course, he, we know that he wouldn't anyway. But that one of the main motifs of the Bible is the covenant. And it is a covenant, um, which is God's chosen means by which he involves himself and interacts with his creation in general and with uh, human beings in particular and especially with his elect, uh, his church. And we can give a definition of, of um, a covenant is this, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly, sovereignly administered. Um, so with that, we can note that the first covenant um, was not in the Garden of Eden. It happened a long time before that. And I want to begin, I'm not going to quote much from John Frame, but at the beginning of it, I want to, um, the eternal covenant of redemption. Quote, The events of the biblical story do not begin in history, or even with God's first act of creation in Genesis 1-1. Other passages tell us things that happened before that creative event. So the story of Scripture begins with God existing in the eternal, glorious fellowship of the Holy Trinity, John 17, 5. I will later discuss the actions that God performs in eternity that we will call His eternal decrees. Every event in history is something that God has planned. And the planning goes back to eternity. For now, I am particularly interested in one particular decree. The agreement between the Father and the Son, often called the Covenant of Redemption, or in Latin, the Pactum Salutis. In this covenant, before the world was even made, God made God the Father gave a people to his Son, chosen in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 4. It was then that he, quote, predestined for us. Um, he predestined, predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Uh, verse 5, and also see John 10.29 and 17.6. And in talking about uh, God, what happened before creation, just need to mention that really that God is super temporal, he's above time. But it just it is helpful to talk about, you know, before uh, in, in informal discussions talking about, uh, you know, backwards eternity. So, um, there we have our first, uh, um, and then uh, add this, let's see, um, yeah. The individual and the universal, the Pactum Salutis, focuses, of course, on God's elect people, those who are finally saved. In that sense, its object is particular, not universal. But Scripture often indicates that salvation has a cosmic dimension. When man falls, he brings the rest of creation down with him. Genesis 3, 17-19 Creation will not be delivered from this curse until the consummation of redemption. So it longs and groans for that day, Romans 8, 18 through 22. Through Jesus, God reconciles all things to himself, Colossians 1, 19 through 20, and makes all things new, Revelation 21, 5. So the pop tomb has a universal meaning. Okay, so much for John for the night. Um, a lot of people have, I guess, a uh, problem with understanding this big book right here, this book we call the Bible, and it seems to them to have so many different parts to it, 
and um, hard to follow. But I want you to know that that um, one of the things about systematic theology that uh, is beautiful is that it helps us to see that in the midst of all the diversity of the literary genres that are used, uh, all the different authors and um, so forth, that God uh, is a God of truth. As he progressively reveals himself from Genesis to Revelation, he does so in a non-contradictory non fashion. And so the, the purpose of a systematic theology is to ask the question, what does the whole of the Bible say about a particular subject? So in this uh, time, it's what does the whole Bible say about the covenants? And the definition I gave, I think, is a good one. It's a bond in blood, sovereignly administered. So if you open your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 2, we'll see that prior to the fall, uh, there was the essence, the substance of a covenant without the actual word there, although in Hosea it, it mentions that. Uh, in verse 16, chapter 2, it says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So at the heart of the covenants is um, the promise of blessings for obedience and a curse for, for disobedience. Now, one of the things that's important about in understanding covenants is that it does really help us to understand the flow of the Bible. Because uh, for many people, particularly, again, if they're uh, brought up in uh, dispensational circles, then their understanding is that these different, quote, dispensations are like watertight compartments um, uh, with 10-foot walls in between each one of them not much of uh, any continuity or connection between them. Um, hopefully I'm not, I guess I'm it's a character, sure, but the Bible, Barit, or covenant, is, that, is the actual word. Dispensation is not in there, but the beauty of the covenant is, it, is how it unfolds. So before I jump into the specific covenants, I want us to get a picture of how covenants unfold. Um, first of all, and we'll see it uh, after the fall, that there is a mm, stream of two humanities. Uh, because of the fall, you have the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And from them, you have flowing out two streams, starting from here, two streams of humanity. And just two streams, either a seed of the serpent or a seed of the woman. There's no tertium quid, no in-between. Either one or the other, believer or non-believer. It's the way it's been, it's the way it's been from the very beginning. So that is uh, one way to look at it. But then specifically regarding the covenants, um, and this to me was very helpful, is that when we see the covenant of, in the Garden of Eden, the next covenant is Noah's. Noah that covenant does not annul the covenant with uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, what it does is that it assumes it and builds upon it. Okay? It assumes it and builds upon it. And then we come to the uh, covenant with Abraham. It assumes the prior two covenants, the Edenic covenant and the Noahic covenant, builds and then builds upon it. Um, and then we come to um, the uh, Mosaic Covenant. Genesis, the ones before it, um, draws it into it and then builds upon it. And uh, so what you have is think of it in terms of concentric circles. You have Eden in the middle, then you have Noah, um, then you would have uh, Abraham, and after that you would have uh, Moses, and then David. Um, they're all part of the circle, and uh, what is contained in the outer circle, the Davidic covenant, it assumes everything before it, 
including the, what happened in the Mosaic Covenant, it's just that each one uh, enriches uh, or builds upon the other one. It, in other, what I'm trying to say is that there is a continuity um, between the covenants. Alrighty? They, they build on top of each other and become ever richer and ever richer and ever richer. It's like a, one door leading into another door which leads into another door. But there's a conscious, the language that's used um, is intentionally showing, for example, in Noah, um, the covenant with him, um, building back to the covenant of creation, where he's told to, you know, be fruitful and multiply. And for me, that was very helpful as a young Christian to be able to follow the flow of the entire um, Old Testament in particular was to, to see it in terms of the covenant and how these were like chapters, so to speak, you know, and that there's the drama of redemption, that there is a coherent flow to it, and in each of the covenants um, is a, they they're they're happy with each other. They they don't uh, they're not at odds with each other. They're not uh, watertight compartments. They, uh, like I said, they build upon each other, assume the the previous one, and then, like I said, build upon. It's like the building of a house. Um, each one is is getting higher and higher until we come to the new covenant, and. I don't want to spend a lot of time on each one, but the first covenant obviously is with Adam and Eve. They fell, as we know. And in chapter 3, we're told the, that starting at verse 14, the, we have um, God cursing the serpent, which is Satan. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. And then uh, the Lord um, speaks to the woman and to Adam. And you have the um, consequences for their disobedience to the covenant um, being spelled out. But then we have the, this is a, the beginning of the covenant of, um, it was always been the covenant of grace, but now it's accentuated. There never really was what, I never liked the term covenant of works. Uh, it's always been gracious, but it is accentuated after the fall, even more so with the entry of sin. And the first act that um, kind of object, objectified the, the gospel is when uh, God graciously clothed Adam and Eve because they were naked and they were ashamed. And uh, it was a picture of God clothing them in the righteousness of Christ. Because we had the first preaching of the gospel in uh, verse 15, where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Jesus, will bruise his, uh, your head, talking to the serpent, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. And... Um, this promise is, um, goes all the way through the Old Testament and then into the book of Revelation. So, uh, but that's the first promise of the gospel. But the first event, expression of the gospel, is when, when God uh, clothes them in uh, their nakedness. And uh, the theme, motif of nakedness in the Bible is something that's profound. And uh, the apparel industry is something that, in and of itself, uh, is a result of the fall. But it really is an indicator of what sin has done as far as our sense of guilt and shame. And uh, But let's move on. From the Edenic Covenant, um, as I said, there's two streams of humanity. And from the very beginning... I mean, from the very beginning, we have the fact of salvation by grace through faith alone. Okay, Adam 
It never has been, never will be. Uh, according to some circles of evangelicals, people, some people in the Old Testament are saved by works, particularly in the Mosaic Covenant. That is not the case. It is always, salvation has always been by grace through faith. Some of the historical um, situations in each covenant were different, but at the heart of each covenant was grace, God's sovereign grace. And we're the finished work of Christ on the cross was either transferred backwards or forwards, depending upon which way um, direction you are from the cross. So the next covenant is with Noah. Uh, that's in chapter 9. And I'm not sure how much uh, to mention about this. Um, like I said, these are like concentric circles. They assume and build upon each other. And then the covenant with Noah, The um, if you look at chapter 6, verse uh, 18, it, it, it talks about uh, God dealing with uh, Noah in context of a covenant. Yeah. Verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, your sons, your wife, and your son's wife with you. So you see the actual verbiage of covenant. And what I want us to see here is the continuity that I was talking about. Chapter 9, um, and we see verse 1, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. Have you heard? Do you remember hearing that any time before in the Bible? Yeah, chapter one, verse twenty-eight. It's called the um, cultural mandate. So again, you see the continuity of the covenants um, building on top of each other, assuming and, and building one layer on top of the other, um, not xing each other out. You know crossing each other out, but instead there's a beauty of continuity and flow. Alrighty, so again, Noah saved by sovereign grace. Out of a mass of fallen humanity, God silently saved him and his family. Then we move to Abraham. The various covenants are Abraham and then uh, Moses, David, and then of course the new covenant. And I wanted to focus, uh, <clears throat> because, well, on Abraham for a number of reasons, but turn to chapter 12, um, verse 1. Now the Lord, um, listen to all the times where it says I, God says I. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So again, you have uh, the idea of... of um, a spreading out of peoples, and it's not just Abram that is meant to be blessed, but he was meant to be uh, a, a blessing to, to all peoples on the earth. That was a whole calling to him. Now, we know from the New Testament in uh, Romans 4, 3 and 4, that uh, he was saved, that is, Abram, later Abraham, saved by grace through faith alone. And if we turn to chapter 15, <clears throat> I wanted to focus on that for a minute. Um, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. And um, jumping down, it says, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then the Lord said to him, So shall your offspring be. Be. Verse 6, And he, Abram, believed the Lord, 
and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, boy, talk about a significant verse um, in terms of church history and in the Bible, um, uh, Reformation. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Okay, so this is 20 or more years before he was circumcised by faith. Okay, the whole point. Paul uses this right here as an illustration of justification by grace uh, alone uh, for salvation, which means by Christ alone. Uh, we have the time. I'm going to read this to you because the idea of a covenant is, and you may have heard this, is um, instead of writing a covenant, it was c cutting a covenant. And the um, way I figured it is, is there's the sign of the covenant was circumcision. And, of course, you cut foreskin there. But also, in a covenant, the, pe the people who were participants in it were asked to um, cut animals in half. Okay? And after they cut, they made a bloody mess, they were to walk between them. And uh, if it was, you know, equals, both the people will walk through it. If it was a solemn type vow about, you know, property or something like that. The idea was that if uh, just like these, this cow is torn in half. If I don't keep my end of the deal, may I be torn in half like this cow? All right, we see you see it in, in Jeremiah 34. I'm kind of ha having to go a little fast here, but um, so when you're talking about the cutting of a covenant, that's behind the notion of cutting up a brit or a, a covenant is that it entails the cutting of animals in half. Uh, showing the solemnness of it. Uh, I mentioned that as a background to what I want to read and, and focus on um, here. Still in Genesis 15, <clears throat> starting at verse 7, And the Lord said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And Abram said, O oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And I try to picture that. They were in, this, were in he had just been justified by faith, God is, is about to um, cut a covenant with him. He's asked him to get all the necessary animals together, and he's done that. All right? He's got a menagerie of animals lined up. Now, listen to this. It's a pretty eerie scene. You know, I've, see, I've been in some paranormal situations, supernatural situations, which were pretty eerie. Um, you want to talk about something that's eerie, a darkness that can be felt. Listen to this. Um, verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. This is a prediction of the uh, Egyptian bondage. But I will bring judgment on the nations that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go back to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And they shall come back here in a fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Um, now here's where it gets, get in, gets interesting. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch 
passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. The Canaanites, Canaanites, Cabanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephraim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Jebusites. God asked Abram to get these various animals to perform a covenant ceremony. Now, generally speaking, Solomon administered, which is usually the person who was pledging authority to the king is the one who would walk through the pieces, pledging authority to the great king. That was the notion uh, that was behind a suzerainty treaty, which is covenants built upon now. Who is it that passes between the pieces? Right, let me back up for a second. Try to picture this in your mind. There's a darkness that can be felt. It's eerie. Very eerie. And in this, you have these cows cut in half. You got sheep cut in half. You're talking about a bloody mess. Slant cut, slam in half. A couple of feet apart from each other. These pieces lined up in a row for someone to walk through as a bloody symbolic um, representation that as I walk through these pieces if I am not um, faithful to this covenant may I be torn apart like these pieces are. However, what I want you to notice is who it is that passes between is it Abram? No. It's the flaming torch, which is a clear manifestation or theophany of God Almighty. In his sovereign grace, he passes between pieces and in so doing says may I be torn apart may I as God be ripped in half may I cease being God may I be non-existent and just torn asunder if I break this covenant with you. Now on the cross, that's what happened. Jesus became the great circumcision. He was cut off. <laughs> my God, my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? And it was on the cross this, this sim, symbolism of walking, passing through the pieces that God literally, in a sense, um, brought to fruition. That when Jesus was on the cross, he was torn apart. The God-man, God in his sovereign grace, sovereign Grace. The father looked down upon his son with tears in his eyes, and the son became what is known as a propitiation. He poured out his unmitigated fury upon his son, so that Jesus not only carried our sin, but that he was punished and became hell for them. So there was a very real sense in which he was torn apart. On the cross, 
and the unspeakable hell and horror that he experienced on the cross was prefigured in that ceremony with Abram, in which Christ became the great circumcision, cut off, but torn, touching his human nature from his father for the first time. And cry out again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And propitiation has been defined as God himself punishing himself in order to save us from himself. That's the seriousness of this covenant vow. Now as we move from there, Genesis 15, we move to the Davidic covenant and 2 Samuel chapter 7. And, excuse me, I'm sorry. We go to the um, Mosaic covenant. And because of time, we won't look at that in detail. Um, but we know that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, that again harkens back to the um, creation cultural mandate of being fruitful and multiplying. And once again, a lot of people, a lot of people have a real misunderstanding when it comes to the Mosaic Covenant. They think that um, folks actually think that during the Mosaic Covenant they were saved by by works, but if that was the case, then nobody during that era was ever saved. Not if you have an understanding of God's holiness. Um, and a lot of what we just saw about what Christ did for us. Um, let me just stop here and say, how can we ever, in light of what God has done in Christ through us, for us, how can we ever say, you haven't done enough you know, friends, if we're blessed that there is even one way of salvation. But God delights in blessing us. We see his sovereign grace just as much, if not more, in the Mosaic Covenant. I want to ask a question. Is it a good thing or a bad thing to have a greater revelation of, of God's law? which manifests his character. You know, we see in Deuteronomy, um, it talks about how the nations would marvel that the people would have, would be so blessed to have the Torah. And uh, it's the, the thing, uh, we can see the continuity between the Mosaic Covenant and New Covenant in you have uh, the two main, um, well, you have Passover, and then you have the sign of the covenant of circumcision, as we mentioned. And we see in the new covenant, we see that instead of the Passover, we have the Lord's Supper, and we have uh, the baptism. Uh, Colossians 2 makes that, um, that connection between the two. And... Uh, well, again, what I emphasize is that um, as with the uh, uh, covenant with um, uh, Adam and Eve, with Noah, with Abraham, uh, it's God's sovereign grace. We're saved by grace, by faith alone. Um, and then as we, um, I'm having to, to move quickly, because the whole idea is I, I don't want to emphasize the particulars of each covenant. I just want us to get a picture of, of the flow of, of history um, by virtue of the way that God dealt with people through covenants. And then the, la the last Old Testament covenant is the one with David. And this covenant, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16, and we see in there that prophets were God's covenant prosecu prosecutors. Um, but there we have the promise of um, 
well, let me put it this way. We, we, we again have the assumption or assuming of everything that came before in the Davidic covenant, including Moses, and then building on top of it. Because the closer you get to the new covenant, the more anticipatory it gets and the more exciting um, as far as the, the major prophets, the minor prophets, the um, more excitement about the coming um, of the Messiah um, is being expressed. And so we have in the covenant with David that he would be a foreshadow of the person of Jesus, uh, King David's greater son. And then, again, I'm, my my intention is not to look at each covenant in detail, but just to see the flow of the covenant and, and how that gives unity to the Bible. You know, it's not just a gibberish mess, but there's a flow to the uh, drama of redemption. So, then we come to New Covenant, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, and I think it would be appropriate if we ended with that. Hebrews chapter 9, then all of these covenants, the starting with uh, chapter 3, verse 15, the, the proto- Evangelion, the first announcement of the gospel, was leading to the new covenant and the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so we'll look at uh, Hebrews 9, verse 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of heifers sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty of the covenants and that you were torn in half. Because of your commitment and steadfast love and fidelity to the covenant, that though we every day fall short of and are unfaithful to the covenant, you from the garden onwards have remained faithful day in and day out, moment in and moment out on our behalf. We thank you for all of the covenants that you used those covenants as a means by which you interacted with us. We're thankful that we live in a new covenant and which in every way is richer and fuller and your grace is more pronounced. But we thank you for the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.